the more profound moments for me personally was when we were in the Isles of Scilly and we did that dive and we brought up the Manila and then we were allowed to go to, to the museum and look at some of the other artifacts that were brought up from that, that slave wreck. And there was a, a beautiful rosary. My family is Roman Catholic. I came from, from Eastern Europe. And I pictured in my mind the captain of this slave ship, uh, you know, in his captain's quarters, probably beautiful and luxurious, praying this rosary while there were men and women chained in squalor below. And it was such a juxtaposition to me. And I thought, well, what are you praying for? You know, good weather? What, what, what are you praying for while you are enslaving human beings below deck? And it was this incredible realization of where in our lives now do we accept something as status quo, which should never be. And I think that to me, that's the takeaway from a series like Enslaved. And I hope a lot of people walk away with, with that kind of an emotional recognition of how they might be applying that blasé attitude to something in their daily lives when they should really question it. If you're tired of arguing with strangers on the internet, try talking with one of them in real life. Welcome to Back in America, the podcast. I am Stan Bertolo, and this is Back in America, a podcast exploring America's identity, culture, and values. In this episode, I speak with three crew members of the Epic's BBC docu-series Enslaved, the lost history of the transatlantic slave trade. 2020 has been a year of intense examination of racism in response to the Black Lives Matter movement, enslaved, however, predate the death of George Floyd. The series stars presenter Samuel L. Jackson, together with Afua Hirsch of The Guardian and investigative journalist Simsha Jakobovici. You will first hear British marine archaeologist Dr. Sean Kingsley, a historical advisor to the film Diving Crew. Then, two of the divers will join me. First, Kinga Phillips, an award-winning journalist of Polish origin, an explorer, writer, TV host, a team member of the Explorers Club, and the first member of the crew to be hired. Kramer Wimberly will then introduce himself. He is a lead diving instructor and leads the Maritime Archaeology Program Diving with a Purpose. Each of the three's interviews were broadcasted live and can be watched in full on Back in America's YouTube channel. As I conducted these interviews, I wanted to understand two things. First, what the diving on the wrecks of slave ships has taught us about the history of the slave trade. Then, I also wanted to the divers to speak about their own experience as they dived and explore these sunken mass graves. I'm a marine archaeologist. I've been doing this for 30 years. Dr. Sean Kingsley. It's, it's a really hard one to get your head around because the numbers at some point, when you start adding zeros and zeros to them, they just become mind boggling and you get a migraine. But we have to confront the reality of what happened over 400 years, which is that 12 million West Africans were trafficked from the homeland, Ghana, Gabon, Nigeria, all the way through what we call the Middle Passage to uh, the Caribbean. And in that passage, two million people died at sea during 45,000 voyages. And most of this trade was actually managed by England and Portugal, who between them um, had 70% of the business. Um, it's really hard to get your head around figures like this, but as a historian, you know, there's been several awful spikes in human behavior down the centuries. You think, of course, of six million Jews being destroyed during the Holocaust in six years. You think about the killing fields of Cambodia, 1.3 million. Maybe some people have deep memory and they'll think of uh, the four million Chinese troops who were cool, who had died during World War II fighting Japan and Germany. But when you think about the slave trade, it went on for 400 years, year after year after year. So you find yourself asking these really core questions of, of 
what happened to these people who died, the two million lost? How did the merchants justify this particular trade, trade making money off fellow humans? And why did society, polite society, uh, put up with it for so long? I was born in Warsaw, Poland, and then came to the United States when I was five years old because my was part of the solidarity movement in Poland. And we came to the US with our suitcases, basically pretending that we were coming on vacation and we were offered political asylum here because of relationship with solidarity. And we actually turned the political asylum down because we were afraid at the time that the government in Poland would not be kind to our family there. So we became US citizens the natural way without accepting the political asylum. Journalist Kinga Phillips. Spent 30, almost 30 years in the fire service. During the course of that journey, uh, I went to law school. Uh, the department saw an opportunity for me to assist them in the division of investigations. So I went to the police academy, became an arson investigator um, and, and worked with uh, uh, a very skilled team. Analyzing and investigating crime scenes was part of my background prior to coming to Diving with a Purpose, which uh, substantially is an investigative mechanism for sifting through the remains of uh, shipwrecks. Lead diver Kramer Wimberly. Uh, racial issues and social issues have always been a part of, of my life and my upbringing from as far back as I can remember. My first uh, contact with the police department was actually in Boston, I'm born in Boston. right? And at five years old, I remember the police kicking in the door of my family's home and us being on the floor in a corner with shotguns pointed in our faces. And that was my um, introduction to the police department and injustice. Living in, in an area where um, racism runs as a thread through every area of human activity for the entirety of your life um, on some level either makes you uh, an advocate right, in the event that you engage right, or a um, victim in the event that you don't um, or blinded to it in the event that you're, you're trying to hide from the reality of what African-Americans face on a daily basis everywhere. we're doing is a real golden age, largely because, you know, you think of those dreams of Jules Verne, 20,000 leagues under the ocean. That's now becoming a reality. So, you know, what we did 20 years ago, mucking around with scuba and shallows, now we can use it in robots in deep seas. So suddenly the world's oceans are oysters and there are three million at the bottom of the ocean waiting to be discovered. For the last uh, 12 years or so, I've been helping out an American team called Odyssey Marine Exploration. And they did the largest offshore survey in the English Channel looking for deep sea wrecks, uh, where they turned up 270 shipwrecks. Anything you might imagine or want for, from uh, French pirate ships through to German U-boats on uh, secret missions, uh, Britain's most iconic lost 18th century warship. And amongst all this mass of shipwrecks, these 270 sites, was this very strange enigma at 110 meters um, that had these elephant tusks on it and copper manila bracelets that clearly had a link with England's role with the transatlantic slave trade. So when the guys were starting, Simcha Jacobovici was starting to make this film, Enslaved, which is an epic, it's taken them two, three years uh, to nail down, uh, we got in touch and they asked me at a conference God, I don't suppose you know if you got any, uh, you know of any slave wrecks out there. And I said, well, funny enough that you should say that. When I was first brought on to Enslaved, I was brought on because the production team wanted a female. They wanted a journalist, a storyteller, someone who was comfortable in the television space who had done that before, and also someone who was a diver. And realistically, that's a pretty small pool of people to pull from for the TV scape. 
And when I came on board and I shot in, in May in the Isles of Scilly, and I remember having a discussion with Simca, our director, who's absolutely incredible. And I said, well, I realize I bring the female perspective to this, but I, I think that we would be good to have a, a well-rounded team. Got a cold call from an international phone number from outside of the country from a gentleman with a, a Russian accent saying, we want you to be in our movie. Each one of those ships didn't, didn't just traffic one time. They went back and forth multiple times, carrying people, killing people. Right? Um, and the, the wrecking event was the last event for those ships. And the wrecking event right, told a particular story about the Africans who were on that particular ship at that particular time. Right. And the inhumanity or the brutality of the people who engaged either in the transport, right, or and or who engaged in the business of um, selling people. Most of the ships that we would investigate were of an era where we're talking about wooden ships. So mostly everything was gone as far as the structure of the actual ship. You would find some rigging. In some cases, we found cannons, cannonballs. We found uh, bricks in Costa Rica. The Isles of Scilly, we actually did find a manila bracelet. And then you start to realize and remember what you're doing there in the story that you're telling. And when you get to the point where you're actually holding an artifact in your hand, and in the Isles of Scilly, which was the first dive that I ever did, we brought up a manila and sitting there and holding that in my hand and realizing that the reason that was on that ship was because it was being used to trade human lives. The floor drops out from under you. You, you have this like heavy moment of realization that you're holding a really ugly piece of history, but it's also important to tell that story. It's also important to hold that, to show that, to, to tell what it means because as you know, history tends to repeat itself, doesn't it? And history also, we, we all have the attention spans of fruit flies these days. So to remind people of what those pieces represent, I think is incredibly important. You can read all the books and you can watch all the documentaries and, and read articles and stories and historical, historical pieces that have been you know, placed before you. But until you are boots on the ground and you were talking to these people, like in Suriname, for instance, one of the most profound moments of the entire journey for us was Suriname, which is a very difficult shoot. We were working 18 hour days. I actually remember being on a boat for nine hours a day with no shade. We were so, so sunburned. I was. Kramer stood and blocked the sun with his body from me because my European skin and my light eyes was just roasting no matter how much sunblock I put on. If we want to talk about being white on this shoot, uh, that was the perfect example. And that day, at the end of that shoot, Kramer said, I have this strange tingling in my skin. I've never felt this before. And I said, Papa Bear, that's a sunburn. Even he was sunburned that day. And I walked away with my lips peeling off and was swollen and, and so sunburned. It was a difficult shoot. But what made it emotionally very difficult was the story of the slave ship Lusden, where all those people were lost. And by lost, I mean murdered. But also because we had the ability to visit this village, a maroon village. And these were people who were enslaved men and women who fought against their captors and the slave owners and escaped into the jungle and created these communities. And we realized in that moment that had the people of the slave ship Lusden been allowed to get off that ship instead of had the hatches nailed down and essentially murdered, they would have joined these communities. And when you are boots on the ground in that place and having that realization, it hits you so much harder than if you ever read that story in a book or a news article or even watched it in our documentary. It's extremely, extremely profound. When you think about the transatlantic slave trade, it was a sea trade. 
the stage for it was the world's oceans. Um, but that's where it's a bit strange because there's lots of history books and, you know, you can delve into all kinds of titles that will talk about what happened in a particular kingdom um, in West Africa or what happened with a particular country. But there's really been no kind of epic take that's gone underneath the oceans. And that's what makes this really visionary and unique is that history tells you what people want you to know. But archaeology is like a camera. It captures the essence of what really happened. And this is really brave filmmaking to go to shipwrecks maybe that people have never heard about. It's not the Titanic, it's not the Mary Rose, and present these. So for the first time in history, we can actually smell what happened in this period, in a sense. Um, because it's one thing to read a book and then put it aside and go and make your coffee and watch some TV. But it's another to dive on a shipwreck and actually physically hold these objects which were around and traded and circulated and touched by human beings in the 1670s to the 1820s. And that means you can't ignore it. You have to confront it and uh, try and make sense of it. As a student of history, right, much of the, the information was familiar to me, right? Um, I would have to say what I learned was people at the time and still today refuse to believe that it occurred, right? And the inhumanity and the brutality of what took place actually occurred. And we still don't want to co confront the reality of it. The, the Suriname mission, right, was around the wreck of the Lusden, right? Um, that, that, that ship right, carried over 600 Africans, right? Um, and what, what happened was the captain took a wrong turn. He ended up going up the Moroni River instead of the Suriname River, right? When they recognized they made a wrong turn, they, they tried to to, to to come out, right? And the ship hit a bank, right? And lost its rudder. And eventually um, there was a recognition that they weren't going to be able to, um, to continue on with the journey to, to move their cargo to market. Um, it wrecked within a couple of hundred yards of shore in what was less than 50 feet of water. Right? Mm -hmm. And instead of, of disembarking people, right, or allowing them to save themselves, they went through the effort of forcing all of the Africans back below deck hammering the hatches shut, right? Because initially they got in their boats and they started to leave. When they realized the Africans were attempting to save themselves, they, they returned. They went back, forced them all below deck, hammered the hatches shut, right? And then sat on the hatches right? and waited right? until every last one of the Africans that they had driven below deck stopped screaming because they drowned. So they killed over 600 people because they made a wrong turn and wouldn't, and the, the idea of, of letting them save themselves was abhorrent. Wow. Um, and being in, in, that, in that space some 400 years later, Um, and I've said this before, but standing on the banks or the shores a couple of hundred yards from where you know right, this, the, the most horrific right, um, wrecking event in the history of the transatlantic slave trade. It's an, it's an idyllic location. Right? Um, today, if you look at it, the scenery is absolutely beautiful. It's 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 a place where people would go to vacation, but 
um, the, the, the tragedy of what took place um, and the, the, the sense of the horror um, still remains there. Right? As beautiful as it is, it is, is, it's just an eerie place to stand there knowing um, of the mass murder, the mass grave that is, is right there in your face. Well, first of all, I will say that Kramer is wonderful with expressing his feelings and he has a lot of them. And we had incredible exchanges on and off camera, having conversations about the subject matter at hand. And it was such a safe space for all of us to share our feelings. We, we cried, we held hands, we, we would walk away and take a moment and really process what they were feeling because it was very deep and very profound. And we had people who had such different lenses and backgrounds and upbringings and just life experiences all bringing something to the table that it, it helped to enlighten all of us and allowed us each to share our own feelings about this, whether it is from a human perspective or whether it's a Kramer feeling it from, you know, Kramer's a former detective, which is why he looked at things mm -hmm. as a crime scene. He also talked about his upbringing and told us a lot about that on, on a personal level over dinners. And so we came to understand very much his lens. When we went to the UK, Alana's father is white and he is from the UK. Her mother is from the Bahamas and she is black. So she has a very very mixed background and she actually met her family for the first time her extended family on camera in the uk which was an absolute fluke that we got there and she went in zance i know this area and it turned out that that is where her father was from and she got to meet family members there so we had all these different incredible lenses and people got to process that. And the fact that it was such a safe space and no one ever said, you're not allowed to feel that you're, you're the white girl. You're not allowed to feel that. Or, you know, you're not allowed to have this emotion or you need to look at it from this lens. No one was ever put in a corner or said, this is what you can or can't feel. We shared so openly that it, it became a, a profound experience for all of us. It changed all of us a global system of white supremacy is just that it's global right? um, and it affects everyone differently right? um, the, the members of the enslaved dive team um, Alana Josh Kinga myself we all have um, different life experiences I'm a little bit older right uh, so my experiences and connection are going to be different. Josh is um, younger than me and lived his life on the West Coast. Right? I lived my life on the East Coast. Right? Um, racism is affected by geography. Racism is affected by skin color. I am darker than, than Josh is. Racism is affected um, by what occurs in the, the, the north of the country and in the south of the country. Racism is affected uh, by what people perceive to be your socioeconomic status. So, uh, and, and, and by age, right? So, um, Josh's experience is going to be different from mine. Right? Alana's experience is going to be different from Josh's and mine because she also has, she's a female. Right? Um, Kinga's experience is going to be different from Alana's and Josh's and mine because she's white. Right. I'm sorry. Right. Um, I, 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 I hate going there. She's Polish by birth. Right. The, the idea of white and black is a construct, right? um, also a banner of the global system of white supremacy, identifying um, races when people are technically um, 
defined by land masses, right? People from Africa, people from Europe, people from the Americas. Right? It was the, the system of white supremacy that said there's white people and then there's everybody else. So we're going to classify ourselves as white right? and pure and everything else is, is other. Right. Right. Uh, so I, 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 I slip into language just like everyone. Um, <laughs> right? But we all have different experiences and different perspectives, but it's all um, based off of that system that is conditioning you mm -hmm. uh, by keeping you housed in particular neighborhoods and not letting you out, which, which is not which was the government's part in, in that, right? Mm -hmm. that government that worked within the system of white supremacy, you had the private sector that worked in the system, worked and works in the system of white supremacy. Um, so we, we all have different, not only perspectives, but different engagement with white supremacy. And everyone's, everyone's perspective um, has to be recognized, acknowledged, and, and appreciated. So um, I try to um, make room for other voices, right? Because I have absolutely no uh, understanding of what it is like to grow up as a black man in the South or a fair-skinned Black woman in the Midwest. I never felt in any way like there was a difference in all of us. There was obviously a different perspective and we all brought different backgrounds and experiences and lenses both in our lifetimes and historical and different contexts. But because we were all such an incredible family unit and we were all so profoundly supportive of each other and the lenses through which we experienced this, I never for a moment felt like there was a distinction between what I was allowed to feel and experience and anybody else. And that's a really beautiful thing to say, I think, especially in the modern world, which there is divisiveness. And it's actually interesting that this documentary came out during this time in history because we were all so profoundly cohesive on a humanitarian level that the distinctions between our skin color and the historical context of our experiences melded together into something actually really beautiful. And, you know, we, we laughed along the way, like in some of the scenes even, we laugh that I'm the token white girl in the in the shots. And it's funny because you see that now when you see the documentary, but from an experience standpoint, there was never such a thing. I was never, I never felt that my perspective or my lens was any less part of the contribution to this than anybody else's. And yet I learned so much and such deep experiences from the lenses of the others. And they all brought something to the table that we all walked away with a completely fresh and different and unique perspective on every single one of these stories that we experienced. And these stories, most of them were not positive. There were a lot of tears shed. There was a lot of heartache and a lot of times that our stomach turned in these moments where we uncovered pieces of history that on a human level were just horrible and devastating and hard to witness and hard to talk about. And it was such a cathartic experience, I think, for all of us to be with such a team that was able to express themselves and, and really work through and talk through these experiences and then also share them with the audience. I felt guilty being a human being and seeing what human beings do to each other which I feel the same way in the modern world, seeing things that, that we do to each other now. So, you know, I think that's what I was saying before that I was never made to feel any different or like I should have felt guilty because of the color of my skin when what we were telling were very human stories and very ugly human stories. 
And many times when we held the shackles or we held the manilas or you know, we held the balls and chains that, that were attached to these people so that they couldn't run away, we felt such immense grief as human beings that this was ever done to anyone. You know, one of the more profound moments for me personally was when we were in the Isles of Scilly and we did that dive and we brought up the Manila and then we were allowed to go to, to the museum and look at some of the other artifacts that were brought up from that, that slave wreck. And there was a, a beautiful rosary. My family is Roman Catholic. I came from, from Eastern Europe. And I pictured in my mind the captain of this slave ship, you know, in his captain's quarters, probably beautiful and luxurious, praying this rosary while there were men and women chained in squalor below. And it was such a juxtaposition to me. And I thought, well, what are you praying for? You know, good weather? What, what, what are you praying for while you are enslaving human beings below deck? And it was this incredible realization of at that time in history, that person felt that this was the way things are. That was status quo and that's what you do. And this was business. And you think about that in, in light of the modern world and how we treat certain people now. And the question becomes, where in our lives now do we accept something as status quo, which should never be? And I think that to me, that's the takeaway from a series like Enslaved. And I hope a lot of people walk away with, with that kind of an emotional recognition of how they might be applying that blasé attitude to something in their daily lives when they should really question it. They wanted to start a conversation. They wanted to have granddads on street corners and teenagers on their mobile phones saying, hey, did you see Enslaved? And, you know, did you know about that aspect of ancestry? Um, and, and I think it will do that by its combination of adventure, exploration, beautiful scenery, and really hard-hitting events um, that happened. I don't imagine that the directors, Simcha Jacobovici and you know, Samuel L. Jackson, when they started making this film, you know, they were making a film about history and archaeology, but they ended up actually living through history. And you know, that's unprecedented. It really is a unique sort of moment. Um, as you say, you know, they were shooting in Bristol literally weeks before the Edward Colston statue, that, that huge iconic Royal African Company slaver, um, his statue was pulled down and dumped into the sea in Bristol. And then they had the, uh, the privilege to film um, the uh, civil rights activist, John Lewis in Washington, sadly weeks before he died. And you see Kramer and Alana from the film, from Diving With a Purpose, they go and meet him and they share their stories of these shipwrecks and what does it mean and how they can, you know, try and make meaning out of it. Um, and there's very much a passing of a torch, which you see there, which I think is really important for the next generations. And he gives them, in a sense, a mandate to make a kind of a good noise, be well behind, but shout and tell these stories time after time and time so that the two million who drowned at sea so that Westerners could put a lump of sugar into their coffee will never be forgotten. And there's a phrase I like to use as a historian, you know, uh, Sigmund Freud you know, used to, and his, and his cronies used to argue uh, psychologically um, that to understand the adult, you must study the child. And I think it's very much the same for today. If you understand society, you have to look back into the mist of time and to try and make sense of the infancy of where we came from. You look at what's happened in the summer and, and the, the reaction and the kind of house of cards that started to fall down. You know, suddenly Lloyds of London are saying, Mayor Cooper, we apologise for what happened in the past. The Bank of England are saying it was appalling, it should never have happened. Look, you can't put value judgments on what happened, but you can try and understand it and make sure that we bear witness. And I think archaeology is a very graphic way of making sure that we will never forget. Um, and, you know, I think this is... There is this healing process. There is this trying to make a fair, and just society. But you also have very large countries that are at the forefront of the slave trade that to this day still have not apologized. I'm not going to name names. Check it online on, on your web engine searches. 
you know, that's one of the reasons why, for instance, I wear several face masks. I'm a marine archaeologist. I'm a writer. You know, it's fun from time to time to dip into films. But that's one of the reasons why I started this new magazine called Wreck Watch, uh, which is the first popular mag about the sunken past and shipwrecks and treasures. And we're taking everyone not just to see the Titanic and understand it, but all these incredible three million other wrecks around the world. So, for instance, on our last issue, we went down to Whitstable in England. Everybody thinks that wreck diving was invented by Jacques Cousteau. Well, it wasn't. It was invented by two English dudes uh, called the Dean Brothers down in Whitstable. And so, you know, we're trying to tell those truths. And I think today what we've been talking about uh, very much and back in America is about truths. Um, and, and, you know, just to create this, uh, close this, this circle in a sense, the next issue out in December in Wreck Watch magazine is all about pirates. For the first time we've got all the world experts who've discovered pirate ships writing under one cover. And again, you talk about what have you learned from this program? What have you learned from uh, the transatlantic slave trade shipwrecks? Well, I didn't know that in the golden age of piracy between 1680 and 1720, um, a lot of black slaves were who were on slaver wrecks. Those ships were caught by the pirates. And the pirates didn't carry on selling and making money off the black the back of their fellow man. Um, they freed those slaves and they invited them to join their crew. So here is the irony. The pirates, like Blackbeard and Captain Kidd, that we feature in the magazine, um, are seen as these enemies of mankind. Actually, in this time, the deck of a pirate ship was the only place in the Western Hemisphere where, outside of West Africa, a black human being could be free and have democracy. He was given an equal vote with every other member on that ship about what should happen, and also they were given an equal divide of the spoils. Um, but you never hear about these stories when you were growing up. You didn't see, you know, black pirates fighting with Errol Flynn. All along, we had been going and telling these profound stories that are incredibly sad and incredibly heartbreaking and, and gut-wrenching even. When you start digging into the details of these and you are on location and below you is the grave of 600 plus people that were murdered, you feel that very deeply. And then we got to the Great Lakes and it was one of our last shoots. And here we are telling the story of the people who made it and the people who helped them. And suddenly it was this I, it, it brings tears to my eyes even now, like it just even the the details of how these people were guided along with signals and certain flowers that were planted and lights and the people who hid them and the captains of these boats who who ended up paying fines and, and put their careers at risk to help these people. We finally got to tell a story that that redeemed humanity a little bit. I'm hopeful. Right? Uh, I've. I've seen movements over the course of my lifetime attempting to address a global system of white supremacy okay, um, that consistently um, have failed because the system pushes back. Uh, this particular time feels a bit different right? uh, because there appears to be um, a global recognition right, of, of what Black people have been screaming about for centuries. Right? Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful, right? that the, uh, the young people that are pushing this movement forward today and those people who are rec finally recognizing the legitimacy of the horror of what is taking place right, are, are moved to do something different. You know, there have been a lot of documentaries done about the transatlantic slave trade. I, I don't know of any that have been done before that were from this perspective of looking at the ships that didn't make it and the stories of those people who were on board and digging so deeply into them and then going and actually physically being in these locations. I think any time that you take the audience to a location and share that experience with them, 
it's going to be a lot more profound than if we just had a historical talking head, you know, spewing facts. I, again, we don't have very, very long attention spans these days. Everyone's on their phone and their iPad and this and that, that you almost have to bring in that, that adventure element to get people interested and then layer in the story into that. And they did such a great job of bringing in a, a Hollywood celebrity like Sam and bringing in Afwa, who is so incredibly eloquent in the way she tells a story. And then Simka, who I think is so wonderful and compelling on camera. And then us, the team that actually goes diving. So you have all these revolving elements that keep the story interesting and exciting. And we're telling it from a different lens that people have not seen before. I spent um, a great deal of time in, in my pain and my anger and my frustration and my rage with which I and every other person connected to the African slave trade is absolutely entitled to. You're entitled to your feelings um, about what took place, what took place and what is still taking place today, right? The consequences of those actions still reverberate today, right? Uh, but uh, we, one, we closed the series um, in the Great Lakes. I, I don't know if that was uh, by design, right? Or just by virtue logistically of how the shooting happened. Okay. But being able to close with the, the story of resilience and people moving from slavery to freedom makes you hopeful. I was fortunate to work on the, the Costa Rican mission. There you had Africans who integrated into the Bribri culture in Costa Rica and survived even in Suriname. There was uh, resistance, and today there are still um, communities, I don't want to call them freed, right, because they freed themselves, who escaped from the barbarity of slavery and established communities for themselves. I learned a lot. I was not expecting to necessarily, uh, but the scale of this thing is just ridiculous. You know, it's a kind of combination of of uh, Indiana Jones exploration meets um, uh, David Attenborough on Blue Planet, you know, going to places in the middle of Ghana, going through jungles, diving to the bottom of the ocean. Some of the scenery, scenery is absolutely incredibly dramatic. Um, and the scenes are very emotional, which is important to pass a torch to the next generation. But, you know, it does for me, it became a kind of a did you know moment. Um, so, you know, they look at all, it's not just about a horror story about this sinister trade, it's also about uplifting, it's about enslaved black human beings who resisted, it's about white people who got on the bandwagon in abolition to help free their fellow man. And you learn so much about the legacy of West African society and how that was transmitted to the West. So. There's one scene, for instance, where they go and meet musicians. I thought that the banjo, for instance, was an instrument used by hillbillies in the American South. It turns out it's based on an instrument that was brought over from West Africa. Then you look at reggae, which emanated from the slave trade plantations in the Caribbean, and it was actually music of rebellion. Um, and at some point in the filming, they were talking about, yeah, next we're going to the Great Lakes in America, and we're filming the Underground Railroad. I don't know what the Underground Railroad, I've never heard of it before. I assume, did they have a 19th century shipwreck down in the Great Lakes that was carrying locomotives? No, actually what it is, and um, you know, I'm sure many of your, your listeners will, will know this, it was a scene that was set up by abolitionists to help escape black slaves from plantations and process them um, all the way to freedom in Canada. Um, and so, yeah, everywhere you turn in this series, there's a did you know moments. <sighs> What's America to me? Ah, it's an experiment, an experiment that is, is still in progress. It's been, for, for me, much of it has been an ugly experiment, but I, I'm hopeful that eventually the equation will balance out.
Thank you for listening today. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends. Also, remember to leave a review on our Apple podcast. These are important to help others find back in America. Thank you and happy holidays.